Hello and welcome to Critical Care Fundamentals. These lectures are meant to be brief and the goal is to give you, the busy provider, a basic framework of common critical care topics. My name is Frank Lodicerto. I completed a combined internal medicine and pediatric residency and then went on to do two fellowships in both adult and pediatric critical care. I currently work in both the adult and pediatric critical care units at Geisinger Medical Center and the Janet Weiss Children's Hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania. I also serve as the Critical Care Fellowship Director. Today's topic is the basics of mechanical ventilation, part two. Objectives. Well, two objectives today. Number one, name the three types of breaths you can get from mechanical ventilation. And then number two, list the two ways these breaths can be delivered. So this is different than I learn, or maybe many of you uh, have heard before. Typically, many vent lectures start out with teaching the modes, but I truly believe that if you learn mechanical ventilation by learning the modes first, you may be left confused as you're just trying to simply memorize modes. If you understand the three breath types and the two ways these breaths can be delivered, I believe that if you're thrown any ventilator mode, you'll be able to truly understand it because you have the basic framework. So let's get started. Well, everybody wants to understand the modes. As understandably, you want to know and understand what is happening to your patient on the ventilator. I first learned the ventilator by learning the modes, but I was left memorizing the modes and I noticed that different ventilator companies use different names for the same modes, so I was left very confused. Once I learned the components, of each mode, like the types of breaths and how these breaths were delivered, then it didn't matter what ventilator brand my hospital had or, or what the brand was called uh, for a, a, almost the same mode, I was able to understand because I knew the basics and the components of each mode. So first, a little bit of terminology. <clears throat> As I mentioned, there are three basic breath types. So these breaths can be delivered via controlled, assisted, or spontaneous breaths. And we're going to talk about those more in the next slide. There's the breath deliveries, so how the volume of gas is delivered to the patient, and that's either going to be by volume or pressure, and we'll talk about this. And then as I mentioned, the modes. Well, I'm going to mention a little bit about modes, but I'm not going to go into modes in this talk. But again, if you understand breath types and breath deliveries, you're going to be able to understand the modes. Because the modes, as I'll mention again, is just combining the breath types and combining the breath delivery. And I'll give you some examples as we go through this. So like I said, before we talk about breath delivery, let's start with the three basic breaths. I like to use a pull-up analogy to help people understand the three types of breaths. Imagine you are trying to learn how to do a pull-up and have no idea how to do one. That's hard to imagine because I'm sure we've all done one or maybe have seen one. But the first step the trainer tells you is to just simply hang from the bar. As you hang, the trainer pushes you completely up the bar a few times and you do nothing, just hang out. And the trainer does all the work. Well, this is a controlled breath. The frequency or rate of the pull-ups or breaths is completely determined by the trainer or the ventilator. And all the work is done by the trainer or the ventilator. So if you're getting a control breath, the rate of the breath is completely determined by the ventilator, and so is the amount of gas delivered. And this can be either by pressure or volume. But the ventilator does all the work to deliver the gas. Now, you have the hang of it, but still not strong enough to do your first pull-up. The next breath is an assisted breath. You can make the effort to start the process of pulling yourself up the bar, but the trainer knows you're not strong enough just yet. So they do everything once they see your effort. So you start the effort and the trainer does the rest. This is an assisted breath. You can start the process and trigger a pull up or in our example, trigger a breath. But once the trainer or the ventilator senses that effort, they again do all the work. So for an assisted breath, the patient can start the breath and determine their respiratory rate, but once the breath is started, like a control breath, the ventilator does all the work. Now you're stronger, and the trainer knows it. The next breath is known as a supported or spontaneous breath. 
Here, you start the pull-up, and the trainer only gives you some support to completely uh, to complete the pull-up. The weaker you are, the more the support the trainer will give you to get you up the bar. The stronger you are, the less support the trainer will give you. In this type of breath, the spontaneous or supported breath, the, the patient starts the process and gets only some support from the ventilator, but they do much of the work themselves. As I mentioned, the modes are simply combining breath types and breath delivery. If your patient is breathing via a spontaneous or uh, supported breath type, the patient initiates the breath and their effort can be augmented or supported by the ventilator. This is known as, uh, a common mode is known as pressure support. The ventilator can completely deliver the rate and the amount of gas, and that's known as a controlled mandatory ventilation, or CMV. You can combine a controlled breath and an assisted breath type, and this is known as assist control ventilation, or ACV. Or the ventilator can take a controlled breath or an assisted breath and combine it with a spontaneous breath. This is known as synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. There are many modes, but these are just some examples of some of the common modes uh, that you can encounter and why a firm understanding of each breath type is essential. Now let's discuss breath delivery. As I mentioned, the ventilator can deliver a volume of gas that is preset and determined by the ventilator known as a volume breath. In this type of breath, the volume of gas is set or programmed to be delivered by the ventilator already. However, the amount of pressure the ventilator had to generate to deliver this volume of gas is not known. The pressure the ventilator will have to give to deliver a preset volume of gas depends on the patient's lung compliance. Compliance is the change in volume divided by a change in pressure. The lower a patient's compliance, or the stiffer the lung, the higher the pressure the ventilator will have to generate to deliver that set volume. As the compliance increases, or the lung gets more stretchy, the ventilator will have to generate less pressure to give the same volume of gas. The other way a ventilator can deliver gas is by setting a pressure. This type of delivery system, the ventilator pressure is predetermined. However, what is not known is the volume of gas. So if a pressure breath is being delivered to a patient with a decreasing compliance or stiffer lungs, that preset pressure will deliver a smaller volume of gas. To give a larger volume of gas in a patient with low compliance, you would have to give a higher preset pressure. And as the lung improves and compliance increases, the volume of gas delivered will also increase. So if you're on a mode delivering a preset volume breath, pay close attention to the pressure. If the pressure is increasing, then your compliance is decreasing and the lungs may be getting stiffer. However, if your pressure is decreasing for a given volume, your lung compliance is increasing. I will discuss the peak inspiratory pressure and plateau pressure in the next slide. However, if you are on a mode that delivers a preset pressure, then pay close attention to the tidal volume. Pay close attention to the tidal volume your patient is receiving. If your patient's compliance decreases, then they will get smaller volumes and maybe inadequate tidal volumes unless the pressure is increased. If your compliance increases, then your patient's tidal volume may be too large unless your patient's pressure is decreased. So if you place someone on a mode which uses a preset volume delivered breath, your patient will get that same volume. However, what you want to pay close attention to is the amount of pressure your patient requires for the ventilator to deliver that breath. The ventilator will display the peak inspiratory pressure, which is the pressure needed to deliver that preset volume. Okay, so you've set them in a volume mode. You are delivering, let's say, 500 cc's to that patient. 
So on your ventilator display, it will give you the peak inspiratory pressure needed to get that 500 cc breath into your patient. This is important to keep an eye on when your patient is in a mode that uses a preset volume. The peak inspiratory pressure in patients without significant lung disease is in, in, in let's say minimal PEEP should be in the teens or definitely less than 20 centimeters of water pressure. In part one, we discussed the plateau pressure, which is the pressure that the alveoli see and can only be measured when a maneuver called the inspiratory pause at the end, at end inspiration is done. This is a static pressure. As I just mentioned, there's a pause, so that's a static pressure. The peak inspiratory pressure, or the PIP, is a dynamic pressure needed to fully inflate the lung and overcome both the resistive and elastic forces of the lung. In a, if a patient has a low peak inspiratory pressure, then great. However, if the peak inspiratory pressure is greater than 30 centimeters of water, you should check the plateau pressure as an elevated peak and plateau pressure would indicate worsening compliance of either the lung itself, such as pulmonary edema, pneumonia, ARDS, or a pulmonary contusion. Decreased compliance can also be from uh, the chest wall or thorax, such as a large pneumothorax, a uh, large pleural fusion compressing the lung, or even uh, large circumferential burns with eschar formations. It can also be due to decreased compliance of the abdomen, such as in patients with massive ascites or abdominal compartment syndromes. Now, if your peak inspiratory pressure is high and your plateau pressure is low, well, that's just telling you that there's high resistance uh, in the circuit. So the patient may be biting their ET tube or it could be kinked. Uh, there may be increased secretions or mucus plugging in your tube, or the patient may have COPD or asthma and they have increased resistance in the airways, uh, like bronchospasm. So uh, doing a pause pressure or measuring the plateau pressure when your peak inspiratory pressure is high gives you a lot of information. So again, if they're both elevated, then you think things that are decreasing compliance. If just the peak inspiratory pressure is high and the plateau pressure is low, well, think about resistance somewhere in the circuit uh, or in your patient, meaning bronchospasm, secretions, or occlusion, or biting the tube. So how does someone decide to use a volume-delivered breath or a pressure-delivered breath? Well, there is no study showing that one type is better than the other, and will depend on the clinician's preference and the clinical situation sometimes. The advantage of using a volume delivered breath is that you have more control over the minute ventilation. As you recall, minute ventilation is determined by the tidal volume, which you control, and the respiratory rate, which may be patient determined depending on whether the breath type is or assisted or uh, controlled. It is, also, it, it is also a good default delivery breath as many clinicians are familiar with the concept of delivering a tidal volume. And if a patient has healthy lungs, you will be able to deliver an adequate tidal volume without too much concern for limiting pressures. The disadvantage of a volume delivered breath is that as compliance decreases, it may require you to deliver higher peak inspiratory pressures, which may lead to barrel trauma. Also, the way the flow pattern is delivered by a constant flow waveform can lead to a patient discomfort and in and of itself can lead to higher peak inspiratory pressures. You are not, we are not going to talk about waveforms in this talk, but we breathe by a decelerating inspiratory waveform. So this breath delivery on a volume delivered breath is by constant flow. It's very machine-like where the flow just stays constant. It's just not how we physiologically breathe. As I mentioned, we breathe by a decelerating waveform. So it, it can be non-physiologic and it could be uncomfortable. This is um, uh, a picture that I drew of what that breath would look like on the ventilator. See how it's a square? Uh, we know known as a square, square waveform, which is a constant, which gives you a constant flow. Like I said, it's, it's, it can be uncomfortable. It's definitely not physiologic, so this may be a disadvantage of using a volume-delivered breath.
An advantage of using uh, pressure delivered breath is that it utilizes a decelerating waveform. We breathe with a decelerating waveform. So there's a very fast rush of air in, and that decelerates throughout inspiration. That's how we physiologically breathe, and that's how a pressure breath is actually delivered. So it can be more comfortable, and it's definitely more physiologic as we're used to it. It also has a lower peak inspiratory pressure compared to a volume breath and improves oxygenation because it has a higher mean airway compression, uh, pressure excuse me, compared to a volume breath. Its disadvantages, however, is that thinking about pressure and tidal volumes during inspiration is, is less familiar concept to many clinicians. We want to know what the tidal volume is, not what the pressure is, and then we have to figure out the tidal volume. Um, so so it's, it's a little less familiar to many clinicians, so therefore it may be uh, something that uh, confuses physicians. But again, you have to give the preset pressure and really look closely at that tidal volume and make sure they're getting an, an adequate tidal volume for that pressure. Um, and again, remember, pressure is based on uh, compliance of the lungs, so you may need more pressure if your tidal volume is low. Uh, if your tidal volume is high, you may, you may need less pressure. So you have to constantly uh, tweak the pressure here, which also, again, may, may be a disadvantage of using a uh, pressure breath. Thank you for listening to Critical Care Fundamentals, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. My hope is that this material has helped you gain a deeper understanding of this topic so that you can make a positive impact on the lives of your patients. Thanks.